live on the other. <coughs> okay, ready. You're ready? Yep. You're recording? Yep. All right. I'm going to take this off. You ready, Jill? All right. So today we are on the Northeast Kidney Foundation's Facebook Live attempt that seems to be above our technical uh, abilities today, but we are recording it. So that's when you're seeing this. I am on Instagram Live. So if you wanted to go see what's actually going on, you can go to uh, my uh, site, which is cooking for the number four, cooking for kidneys, and you can catch that. Um, so that's the plan today. Hi, I'm John Vito. I am the creator of Cooking for Your Kidneys, and I am a patient. I am a transplant recipient. I am an author, and I am working with the Northeast Kidney Foundation today to provide you with some recipes and some information about kidney disease, about cooking, about food. Okay, so we have two recipes today. Normally I have an overhead camera, which today we do, and uh, you'll be able to see that on the recording later. And maybe on the Instagram, when I look over here, uh, we can move that around when and if necessary. So we'll see how it goes. We're gonna give it a shot. All right, so here we go. Today we're gonna start with Tuscan bean soup. Now Tuscan bean soup is a combination of a couple different beans, lots of veggies. Um, it's pretty good. As a matter of fact, it's really good. And because of the new diet with the kidney, uh, kidney patients, both uh, prior to having end stage and even after, um, we can eat beans now because the phosphorus doesn't absorb. Before, we couldn't really do that. And that was an issue. So we're going to give it a shot uh, to make this soup. But it's really good. And it will have some health benefits. The first thing we're going to do today is we're going to take some chopped pancetta. Now, before we go on and you, you start to see some of the ingredients we're using and you think, hey, do I need that? Or can I eliminate that? Can I substitute that? I wanna give you just a quick rundown. But first, what I'm gonna do is start the pancetta and we'll talk about that. So I have over here is a little pot, my cast iron um, enameled and I'm gonna put my pancetta right in there. Um, it's gonna take a few minutes to render down but it shouldn't be too bad. When I do walk away from cameras, from Instagram, it just means I'm getting some other things that I might've forgotten. And then I come back. So I just have a little screen to make sure it doesn't splatter too much. So that's just gonna render down and we're gonna use that in the soup and use it as our base. Wandered away, I'm back. Okay. So let's talk about this. One of the problems we have with food today is that we have taken a great deal of time and effort and money to create everything easier. We wanna make it simpler, we wanna make it easier. And that creates things in boxes, things in cans, three things already done and cooked. Um, and often when we, take, we do that, we reduce some of the techniques and the steps that we've taken to make that food really taste good. So they have to make changes and those changes are things to add flavor. And often they're sodium, they're phosphates for preserving the food on shelves. So we have a lot of um, chemical ad additives. We have some processing to make things a uh, large scale available. And then we have to make adjustments to that in order to make them taste good. So what I do is I'm trying to back a lot of that up and then do it in the right order and do them maybe like we used to do them with some new techniques and with some of the advancements. So when I say, hey, can we, can we do we not have to do, or do we need that step? The answer is often no, but you may not taste as good. So that's what we're, we're gonna kind of highlight today and almost all of the steps and ingredients. Um, so I have this, uh, my pancetta rendering. I'm gonna turn that up a little bit just so it goes faster. With any luck, it won't burn and this to make sure that we don't all get splattered, meaning me. Okay, so you can get a good look at that. Um, what I did is I put in about four ounces and there's gonna be a lot of soup. So you don't have to use this. It doesn't have to be a meat-based soup. It can be a vegetarian. Um, but again, you, as we just talked about, some of the flavors are gonna change. And the same thing goes with the stock I'm gonna to use today, which is a chicken stock. Uh, and you could use a veggie stock. So I just got my chicken stock available and we're gonna throw that in later on. Um, so that's where we are. I'm gonna do some veggies. I'm gonna cut them up while we talk about some of these other things. 
the, the, the little trilogy that we're going to use is carrots, onions, and celery. Here are my products. Just because I don't like to cry on TV or on live or on recorded, I've already cut my onions. So I'm just trying to be a little bit uh, helpful there. But again, fresh veggies. I know it may be a little more work, but we want to suggest you buy them uncut so that they are fresh and you don't start exposing a lot of the veggies to air, which then they start to degrade a little bit, um, et cetera. So we're just gonna cut these up while that renders. We're gonna use some of that pancetta fat. Now you could use bacon. You could use guanciale, which is from the cheek. Um, you, and the, the, but the, the guanciale and the bacon, I'm sorry, the guanciale and the pancetta are not gonna be smoked, which is yet another flavor. So if you wanna add a little smokiness to that, you could certainly do that. Um, and that would be fine too, uh, if you want that flavor. I just choose pancetta because I prefer that. So I'm just gonna cut some veggies here. Check my sheets to see what else we need to talk about. So in the past, as I mentioned, there's a lot of phosphorus in uh, beans and it was kind of shunned upon for us to use that, especially if you were on uh, some kind of phosphorus restriction. Um, it's usually where, where that would come in is during, let's say um, dialysis or if you had some troubles with it overall because they're high. But what they've learned is that the type of phosphorus in fresh fruits and veggies um, doesn't absorb into the body. And that way we can get all the nutrients that come with beans without getting all the absorbable phosphorus. And that's really helpful because a lot of the foods we used to be able to, or we had to avoid, uh, had a lot of nutrients and had a lot of benefits. As a matter of fact, when I started, we couldn't eat white uh, or wheat flour. They wanted us only to eat uh, white flour because it had high phosphorus. Even though when you use wheat flour, you get a lot of the nutrients and it's removed when you only use parts of the wheat berry. Um, so that's just one of the little changes that they've made. You take a quick look now as I lower this and we try not to splatter too much, but you can see that some of the pancetta is just starting to render, meaning the fat's coming off. And we're just turning it around a little bit. Oh, going pretty good. So we're doing pretty well there. I don't want that to go too high and I just wanted to make sure it gets done. Okay, so again, fresh veggies. Yeah, I prefer them just because like, as I mentioned, once they're exposed to air, um, they start to lose a little bit of their flavor. They degrade a little bit. Uh, it is not easy, but if you bought those prepackaged cut up veggies, you know, that's gonna to work too. Don't, don't think that you have to do it this way. Um, I just like to tell you what some of the reasons are why I do this and how to add some flavor. Um, and it's helpful, I think it works. It also can help if you wanna learn, help you uh, advance some of your knife skills. Uh, certainly you could use a food processor or any one of those tools they have out there. I do prefer chunks, not the, sh not the shredded version because um, it's a soup, uh, that's what I prefer. You could do it either way, just know that they'll cook faster if you do it that way. So here's kind of our mirepoix, the carrots, celery, and onions. You can see that I'm cutting them into sticks and then just using chunks, trying to get them about even because what I'd like to do is uh, have them cook all evenly at the same time. I know I'm not looking up at you at Instagram or at my recording, but you're seeing my hands. So it's probably better if we do it that way. Okay, let's check our progress. Ah, we're doing wonderful here. Now, the last thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna cut up some garlic and that should bring us right to the time that this is ready. You can see that's coming along. There's still a few spots, but what happens is the, the fat begins to melt from the pancetta, which is the same cut as bacon. And as it melts, it heats up and it actually fries the pieces of meat right in there. So very similar to chicharrones. Um, 
which I think I have on one of my other websites. I'm gonna drink some water, please. Everybody hanging in there? Anybody watching? I hope they are. This is fun stuff for me. So let's talk about garlic. Um, I use fresh garlic. I use it all the time. I don't use anything else. Occasionally I use some of the granulated for things that I'll talk about later. Uh, and there's some reasons. Garlic, of course, starts to deteriorate as well as soon as you start to cut it up. I do remember having a conversation with somebody at one of these pre-COVID when we did the live cooking events. Uh, hey, what about that? That stuff I use in, um, in the jar that's already cut up. And there, let's call them stages. You know, they're, they're, the fresh garlic, whole, unpeeled is the best. Fresh garlic peeled in a little container is really good. And cut up garlic and oil is worse. And it goes down and down for a lot of different reasons, which we will kind of begin with. You can see that this is just pretty much done. So we're gonna turn that right off, let it cool a little bit. Eventually what I will do is reduce or remove some of that fat. Uh, we won't use it all. But with the garlic, the garlic doesn't, at this point, garlic doesn't really smell all that much, okay? So it doesn't really have a great deal of odor. It has two um, parts in the cells of the garlic. So they're, when they're combined, that's when they start to smell. Now, one is an enzyme and one is an amino acid. And the way they combine within the cells is by smashing them. So if you take your knife and you smash them and you chop it up, you constantly are mixing that up and you're getting more and more flavor. If you like a light garlic, like the lightest, you would take a whole peeled piece of garlic and throw it into your dish and then saute it around in some oil because you want to get the flavor into the fat, the oil, the butter, those are the fats, and remove it and you would get a very light garlic. If you want to just cut it up uh, into big chunks, same thing, it gets a little better. So the more and more you smash it, the more and more you release all that flavor. Then when you cook this garlic, you will begin to lose, it'll start to mellow a little bit. Um, so I just think that's important to know when you're cooking, you know, how much garlic do you want in your dish? How strong do you want it to be? Do you want to cook it in there and then remove it? Uh, you know, there's a lot of options. But again, it brings us right back to this idea about those good jarred garlics that are in the oil. One thing that happens quite a bit in those is you get a lot of additives. So they'll actually add a phosphorus chemical to help keep its color and to keep it set up. So you need to look for that and be very careful on the labels. Um, it's important. Uh, and again, the flavor is gonna be different. So I would like you to, uh, you know, if possible, get some fresh garlic, find it. Um, by the way, I've heard rumors on the internet. I don't know if they're true, but the ones with the big tall stems are either from this side of the continent and not made in China or ripped up from over there. So I don't know if that's true, uh, but hey, I always look for these ones with the big tall stems. You know, that one I believed. So anyway, I've cut this all up. I've got it to a reasonable size. Again, in a soup, it's gonna disintegrate a little bit, so it's fine, but it will release lots of flavor at this point. Uh-oh, it's falling off my shelf back there. So the second thing I'm gonna do is try to scoop out some of this if I can do this properly. Yeah. So you can see that there's quite a bit of fat in there. Um, you could use it, not the, the best thing for you, but certainly it's not bad. We're gonna use some, let's see how nice and crispy that pancetta is. It's just, just delightful um, and delicious. So provided that's not too hot and it is not, I'm gonna do this right in my sink. You won't see, you'll see the back of my head for a minute. All I'm really doing is removing some of the fat, keeping all the pancetta. That's why I have that little strainer. And hopefully we're not gonna burn anything, including me. All right, so you can see I've left a little bit in there. I am going to get myself back up there. It's already a little warm. So I've got my rendered fat, got my pancetta, which I'm gonna throw all that in. I'm gonna throw in a little bit of that. You can see it's cooking, I smell it. Now I'm gonna add the onions for my soup. Again, I cut them earlier. 
Uh, hopefully you'll understand why. There are obvious reasons, so I'm not crying. And then I'm going to add first the celery and carrots. I'll wait on the garlic. I just don't want it to burn because it burns very quickly. It goes from step one to step two, meaning not cooking to burnt within seconds. So I just want to get these in there. And then I'll add that in the end for just for a few minutes. So you can see the pancetta will kind of mingle with all the other flavors. So in the oil and the fat will absorb flavors of the uh, mirepoix in there as well. And then that oil and fat will circulate through the entire dish and give us all these wonderful flavors. And that's kind of one of the things we talked about how originally soup was made that way. I don't know if they go through all these steps with this packet soup or canned soup, and that's why we get some different flavors. Now, let's talk about the next step we're gonna add, which is chicken stock. Same thing. You can use veggie stock if you wanted, but I make my own chicken stock because even low sodium chicken stock has a ton of it. I will take a whole chicken and roast it first, then I will boil it, take the meat off, then boil the bones with veggies. I use it, I have it in my freezer. I put it in small containers and, and freeze it. Uh, and, and that just pulls, I pull it out when I'm ready to use it for a single or a double. The flavor is much better. You know the control, uh, you have control issues so you can keep the sodium levels down. You can keep the flavors you like increased. Um, so if you can try to find it, try to make it. I tend to make a whole chicken, use the rest for, you know, strip it of the meat and use it for chicken salad or just chicken sandwiches or grilled chicken breast, something that's already cooked. So you can use it for, a, for any kind of meal. You can add it to rice and beans or whatever you're eating. Um, so I highly suggest that. So here, we're just gonna soften these up. Now, normally I'd cook them a little longer, but because it's a soup, all these veggies are going to cook in the soup for a while and they'll soften up and they'll be just fine. So now we're gonna add our garlic. And this is where you wanna make sure you don't walk away. You know, I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times. If you watch cooking pe people cook or you do it yourself, get it on the heat, keep an eye on it. Now I can smell right away that bitterness of the garlic. And I'm gonna to try to reduce that bitterness with the heat and hopefully it'll work out just fine. And I'm gonna get some water. Okay, how are we doing? Everybody happy? Good. All right, the next thing we're going to do, once we add our chicken stock, which is going to do in a second, is we're going to talk about beans. Beans are the same issue as stock. Um, I have two here, and you want to make sure you, if you can, because Instapots are so popular now, or if you have a pressure cooker. Years ago, we would get dry beans, cook them in a, in a stove or, they, um, or a pressure cooker. And we have beans and we would do things to those beans that they don't always do in those can. We would flavor them. We would add whatever flavors we're utilizing in the dish, the beans are going in. We would cook the beans in garlic, onion, carrots, celery. You can add spices. And what you're adding here is a layer of flavor to your beans when you cook them yourself. So it just works so much better and it really brings out the flavor. The way they do that in cans is they add a ton of sodium and a lot of phosphorus at times. So you have to rinse and rinse and rinse just to get that sodium off, but you're still gonna get a lot. There are low sodium beans, they are better. Same thing, it's a scale. You know, if you can find no sodium beans, how great. But let's just show you what I did here in the overhead. I have cooked red beans and you can see I even have carrots and there's some celery in there and some things I used. And I'm gonna leave them and throw them right in. And here are my canned beans, which I've rinsed and rinsed really not a lot of difference. You know, they, they really come out the exact same. Um, so again, you want another use for that Instapot somebody got you or that you use? There it is, just buy dried beans and you can put them in the fridge when you don't use them all. You can add them to things really healthy and good for you, especially if you're either on a vegetarian diet or even a vegan diet. Um, so I think we got a pretty good mix here. I can smell. My garlic's doing really well, meaning it's mellowed in flavor and it's not burnt. So what I'm gonna do is add my chicken stock. Again, this is my own stock and I just threw some on the table there. Isn't that lovely? Got about six, uh, six cups there. 
So we're making a lot of soup. Now I'm gonna add beans. I'm gonna add more beans and I'm gonna add some spices. Now you'll notice I have not put any salt in anything yet. First of all, I know there's some salt in the canned beans that I used. So we have some sodium there. There's gonna be a little bit of sodium from the beans I cooked, but I am gonna add a little bit. So, you know, you just gotta keep an eye on where your salt is and how much you're using. So I'm just gonna add some good kosher salt to that. I'm gonna add some black pepper. My next spice is parsley, just a little bit. Here I'm using fresh. I try to buy fresh as often as I can. And the final spice is some oregano. Oregano strong, this is dried. Try to use a, you don't, you know, a little goes a long way. I guess that's the saying, right? Now we're just gonna let our soup, as I bang things around, cook. You know, 25 minutes, it'll be ready. The last thing I'm gonna do now, I should say the penultimate, a second to last, is I'm gonna add some greens. Now, normally I add spinach, but today, um, because spinach is high in potassium, because spinach reduces to, you know, you need a lot to reduce to a little bit, you're gonna get a lot of potassium. So unless, if you're on a potassium restriction because of kidney disease in any level, try another green. In this case, I'm using um, um, escarole. You can use any other greens you like that doesn't reduce like that and doesn't have a high level of phosphorus. So I'm just gonna add this in. Now, again, I've got this chopped and ready and it's gonna cook right in the soup. And I, so I don't have to pre-cook it. Spinach would do the same thing. You just would want to add it earlier or later. I'm sorry, because it just cooks down pretty fast. Okay, now let's talk about one last ingredient. If you have seen any of my other little mini episodes or read my book, I'm plugging my book, yes, plugging my book. Um, you'll see I do a lot with fresh Parmesan. I, I only buy it, I only use it. I don't use the stuff in the can because it's not even Parmesan cheese. It's actually cheddar cheese. Uh, it has other things in there that aren't helpful. So I buy it in a block. I don't even buy it pre-grated because they also add some filler in there. Not bad for your filler, but it reduces the flavor, which means you'll use more, which means you're getting more of good or bad cheese. So what I have here is the piece of, oh, it's the rind. You know, you, you, you go as far as you can with the grater to get all the cheese you can. And you find this and I put them in the freezer in a big bag. A lot of people do this, but then I just drop it in the soup and that's gonna add some sodium. That's gonna add a wonderful flavor. It's not gonna melt completely. It's just gonna melt a little bit and it's gonna add some flavor through the whole dish. Now you can add a little more water, a little more stock, but you'll notice that uh, this will, these uh, greens will cook down a little bit. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna move it over to my stove so it can cook. And we're gonna consider making another dish. <coughs> While I cough, excuse me. So that is Tuscan bean soup. Again, if you choose to use veggie stock, it's fine. If you eliminate the pancetta, less fine, but certainly will be good. You can bump up some other spices that you like. Uh, it should work just fine. Um, but that's, that is a traditional Tuscan bean soup. It'll be done in about 20 minutes. It's really quick and it's, uh, it's delicious. Um, so I think that's about all I want to talk about with the greens. I'm just checking my list to make sure we've covered all the important parts about flavor layering, each one of the steps done individually. Um, and the other thing too is that you notice it's a big pot. I made a lot of soup, but I always refrigerate or ref I freeze it in little individual portions so that if I just need something, especially if it was a dialysis day or if it's a just a day you feel tired and exhausted from having kidney disease, you can just pull one out of the freezer throw it in there and you've got some uh you've got some soup lots of good nutrients a lot of good uh of the health benefits so you know it's it's helpful there is some fluid in there in case you're on dialysis but you can make it a stew by just reducing the amount of liquid you put in there so you get all this wonderful flavors all right i gotta take a breather just for about two seconds while i drink some water and I take a breath and we've already moved on to the next recipe all right so because we're not live, because we're recording with our issues, at least on Facebook, um, there aren't any questions. So that's, uh, that's gonna be just fine. 
All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to make um, some risotto. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the techniques. And if, for those of you who have made it, there's a lot of ways to do it. Seems uh, it's pretty easy. But again, there's techniques, there's styles, there are things you can do to increase flavor. Part of being a kidney patient is the, is the my dietitian friends tell me, don't use restrictive diet, use uh, the different terms are challenging. So people don't feel like they're being put into a box and saying that these are opportunities because they are now with the new changes in the diet. So we can do a lot of good things here. Um, we can add a lot of ingredients, but if we use some cooking techniques and styles, we can actually really jump up the flavor without adding any of the flavor additives, fat, salt, chemicals, et cetera. So I'm going to turn on my pan and we're going to get this started. So one of the first things that I changed about making my risotto is I use this pan. This is a very wide bottomed pan. Uh, not, it's not a pot, it's a, this is the way we want to cook it. And the reason is I want the heat to be even along the bottom. I want the rice to be as close to the heat as possible and not stacked. If the rice is stacked up, it means that the top levels are going to be cooking at a different rate than the lower levels. Um, and unlike when you cook regular rice, which is that you put it in water and you're actually covering it, you're steaming the rice as well as absorbing that. So in this case, we're not doing that. You know, this is going to be heat and vibration and the little rice pebbles rubbing against each other. Um, so we want to make sure we have even heat. So again, first thing you can do is find the flattest, biggest pan you can, and that's the one you're going to want to use. Um, we're just going to wait for that to heat up a little bit. Second thing we're going to talk about is the rice. Okay. This is a Boreal rice, probably the most popular, probably the one you've seen everywhere. Um, it's good. It's really, it's, it's the Italian version of rice that you can find. There are two others you can use. I think that are just as good. One is even actually better. Um, it's the rice they use for paella and, um, it's got a different name and that's, it's Bamba rice. I'm sorry. It's coming to me. So you can use that. And that's really good, even though it's the one they use in paella. And you ever wonder if when you make paella at home, if you don't use the right rice, you don't get that, uh, kind of gelatinous and soupish texture, stewish texture, you just get rice and veggies. And that's one of the reasons if you don't use the right rice. So please do that. Uh, but again, there's another one called a carnarali, carnarali, something like that. It's even better though. The differences in the rice is that they are all short grain rice. So you might be able to see that here, maybe here if we get to that. They're short grain rice. And what they're gonna do is rub up against each other and there's an outer coating that's going to rub off and it's going to kind of self-sauce this, this dish. Um, and that's what we're looking to do. Uh, there's a whole bunch of thoughts about whether you should rinse it first and then use that rinse water. But let me just tell you why the rice is different. Um, it's the different levels of resistant starch. And one is um, amylose and one is amylopectin. So for any of the RDs out there or any of the nutrition science people, um, you want a rice, want a rice that's higher in uh, amylopectin and low in amylose. The amylopectin pectin creates that kind of saucy uh, texture. So that's what we're looking for. The aboyo rice has almost no amylose and all amylopectin, the kind of resistant starch. Just a little science tip there. Okay, so I, my pan is uh, is hot. I'm going to add a little bit of oil and a little butter to that. Start with my fats. Hopefully we'll get this done pretty quick. It should take a little while. Now, one of the other key factors uh, or features in this, as I walk away again to get another stirring utensil. There we go. Is that we use wine in this dish. Uh, which we'll get to. So we don't use a lot, so you shouldn't be too worried about any of that. And some of the alcohol, if not all, is going to cook off. But what we're doing is we're going to melt this combination of butter and oil. I used olive oil. I always use a good oil, a good fat. Um, olive is really good. Some of there are others that are better, meaning than the the worst vegetable oils. So try to avoid those. Even though some of them have flavors, some of them are neutral. 
I like the added flavor of olive oil. Again, adding flavors, adding layering them without adding sodium. It is a fat, but it's a better fat. So that's looking pretty good there. The first thing I'm gonna do is saute some onions for my risotto. And remember when you're sauteing onions, unlike when I put them in the soup, I not only do I wanna get some of that flavor into that fat, but I also wanna get them uh, sweet. And as the longer they cook, the sweeter they're going to get. And that's uh, it's gonna add a nice little flavor to them. So with the rice, once we add it in there, the whole idea is that we're taking our rice and it's absorbing water and we're moving it around and the starch from the outside of the rice is going to turn into the sauce as it absorbs. That's why they say you have to stir it all the time. But maybe you do, maybe you don't. There's some good science that says you don't have to move it too much, just move it you know, infrequently, you know, every time you put a little batch of fluid in. Um, so anyway, that's what we're doing. We're just trying to get this a little sweet. Yeah, already it's hit. You can smell the butter, that's gonna be helpful. Now, in addition, what I'll have is some very hot, warm chicken stock. The other thing about risotto, they say you should use warm fluids. Uh, yeah, it'll just go faster. Do you have to? Again, if you check a lot of different um, chefs, they'll say you don't have to, but it just goes faster. I don't mind cleaning an extra pot just to have the meal done quicker. So we use that, it absorbs well. Add it a little at a time so that it doesn't get overwhelmed with the fluid and then, and then the little rice pieces can rub together because if they're swimming, they're not rubbing together and you're not creating that extra starch and that extra sauce. Um, so that's pretty important. All right, again, one of the things you can do and they've tried to make this uh, argument, I've tried it, I think it works well, is you could take some of the stock or some water, rinse this, drain it, reserve the liquid, and then add that in. So what happens is the liquid will turn white, that's some of the starch rolling off, and then you reserve that starch to help add it to the sauce when you're adding all your other liquids. All right, so this looks pretty good. I think we're ready to add the next step, which is the rice. Now, here's another one, another layer of flavor to add. We're gonna toast the rice, and then that will add this nutty flavor to the final dish. If you don't, you won't get the nutty flavor, and you'll have uh, one layer of flavor gone. Uh, maybe you don't want that, but it really is noticeable and it's really supposed to be the um, one of the features of a good risotto. Now you can see because I used a wide flat container, a lot of the rice is going to hit the heat and the fat and kind of toast for us. We're going to let it sit. We're going to turn it over. It doesn't just take a couple of minutes <coughs> while I reach into my fridge. So because I live in the Finger Lakes area, I thought we would use a nice dry white wine. It's a salmon run. Hopefully they don't mind me saying that. Too bad, I already did. Um, and we're gonna use just a little bit of wine in there again. It's gonna boil off the alcohol, but it's gonna retain all the flavors from the wine. Excuse me while I hydrate. Okay. Just check it on my soup, make sure everything's cooking. I'm gonna give it a quick stir. Beautiful, everything's good. So it doesn't take long. You know, you'll even be able to smell it. You can see how some of that it, rice is even getting a little texture to it, a little color. That's what we're looking for. Flatten it out. Again, it doesn't take long, just a little bit. And then we're gonna add some white wine. Now my wine here is cold. Again, just as we talked about, uh, I kept, I, because I made a batch earlier, Put the rest in there. So it will just take a little longer for the wine to absorb, but that's it. All right, I can feel the sticky of the stickiness of the rice in the bottom. That way I, I, that way I know it's getting toasted. I'm going to add a little bit of pepper and just a little bit of salt because we use some good Parmesan in here, there'll be some salt added there. So now we're gonna start the process of just trying to Moisten the rice and get it to absorb all those fluids. So you can see right away. See how the rice is touching each other? I didn't add too much fluid there. 
so that they're, and you push it around, they're rubbing against each other. The starch is gonna come off. It's gonna create that lovely sauce. It's a flat pan. So it, all of the rice, if not most of, most of not all is getting um, direct heat, not a layered heat, like, you know, going up the pot where some of it's cooking and some of it isn't. And you can see how fast that went away. So now if I had remembered to get a ladle, as soon as it gets to a point like this, we just start adding more fluid. And you know this, it's usually about a four to one ratio or so. Play it by ear, make sure it cooks well, add some water if you run low, whatever you need to do, but go slow. Uh, make sure that it, it's got enough to absorb and yet still not swimming in there you know, and that way you can rub. So that's it. I just put that against there and you can see it's starting to bubble. It's going really nicely, really well, I think. Now this is the base of risotto, okay? This is just the simplest form. And from this point, we can add all kinds of flavors, anything we want virtually. Um, I don't suggest sweets, but you could try it. I don't think that would be very good. Um, but things like asparagus, things like other vegetables. So you can add all these wonderful vegetables to that. You can even do proteins. Most often we use fish. Uh, today we're going to add a little shrimp to the end. But the flavorings or the aromatics I'm going to use today are a lemon and some fresh basil. So really what we're going to have is a lemon basil risotto base. And then we can just layer some protein in there, which is some shrimp that I've cooked up and you just throw it in, you toss it around, you get some of the flavors in there, warm it through because I've already cooked it. And I cooked it in, you know, same, similar flavor patterns here, some garlic, some oil and a little wine. So same thing. Remember we talked about how you don't want to use too many processed foods, too many other ingredients. Uh, I'm using a whole lemon. And from the lemon, I'm going to use two parts of it. I'm going to use the zest, um, there's a lot, the zest has all this wonderful oil and flavor. It is gonna be uh, noticeable right away when you do it, you'll smell it. Those oils are gonna get right into the food. Those oils will probably absorb all the other flavors like most fats do, they will then circulate and you'll just have a wonderfully um, fragrant and pungent dish, pungent meaning in a good way. So that's the kind of stuff you wanna do. These are the, those little techniques we talked about where you can add flavor without using the basis of sodium phosphates or any of those quick little devices that they use. So again, while I do this now, because I wanna add that flavor into the liquid, which absorbs into the rice. So each little bit of rice is gonna get some of that. So we're starting with that. Now I'm going to use an addition, some of the lemon juice. And I'm just going to run it through here so that uh, some of the seeds don't get in there. Again, same concept, liquid is uh, hydrating the rice. You don't have to use those tools, whatever you like. But what I suggest you do is use fresh lemons. Those little uh, real lemon, I'm sorry to use brands of those little jarred bottled lemons, same thing. You know, they've been in there, they're strong, but they just don't have that real lemon flavor. It's very different in my opinion. And when you use the lemon zest, you're also getting a lot of nutrients too. Uh, that's important. I can smell it now. It just smells like lemon in here. It's wonderful. Okay, see, I got a bunch of pits out of there. I used to use that to strain them. That way I don't get to worry about them later. A little more removing around. Starch is rubbing off. You can kind of see that creamy texture. There's never gonna be any cream added or milk. Uh, add this uh, heat up a little bit. And once again, I don't have to do a really small. I'm just gonna keep rolling along with Uh-oh, we got a little wet, so it's getting mad. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Very sensitive, apparently. Okay, so we're going to add some basil. 
Now I'm gonna add some now to cook in there again. Whole basil leaves have oils in them with all the flavor. The dried ones, a lot of that goes away, but they have their own unique flavor. But again, fresh basil, as much as you can. Some people think you shouldn't even chop it with a knife. You should tear it because they don't want you to have the, the flavors kind of jump out and land on the table and not in here, just like with the lemon zest. But I'm gonna do this now and then I'll add some at the end too. So you have that combination of the oils from the cooking and then the freshness of fresh basil in the end. Get some good heat on that and I'll keep going. Okay, I think we're doing pretty good. Other things you can do, you could add garlic if you wanted in the beginning stages. I choose not to. Um, I like it in some things. I don't love it in everything. And I don't think you have to, but again, your choice on that. Uh, there is most, almost all recipes you'll see, maybe 50, 60% are gonna have some garlic in there. Uh, I prefer it without, but that's again, that part can be a personal choice. You can see it's bubbling, it's getting there pretty nice. Now the last thing we need to add at the end, provided I can find it, this is kind of the last kind of key ingredient that we use, and that's fresh Parmesan or Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, here's the block. I use exclusively this stuff. Things you want to look for are the label. Can you see that? There's like a, it has a, it has an imprint around it. And that imprint means that it's from Italy. It's been through the process of making sure that it's legitimate, that from the right cows, believe it or not, from the right region, eating the right grass. And the other stuff is sometimes good, but generally not as good. And what does that mean? Flavor is less. You'll have to add more. So you're adding more things that are not great for your diet if you are a patient. Um, now, the other nice thing about it, which I find fascinating, make some room here, is that you don't need a lot. Now, this is my scale, and I'm just going to um, flatten that. I got a tear weight on there, just means to zero it out, and then I'm going to weigh it. Okay, so you can see it's nice and light and fluffy, even some of the lemon from the earlier is there, but that's since it's going to the same dish. Now, I'm not gonna add this to the heat. If I do that, it will stick to the bottom of the pan, believe it or not. So I always add this Parmesan as far as dishes like this and sauces when it's off the heat and I put it in there. Okay, so at this point, I haven't even hit, there's a half an ounce of cheese. And that's, that, that's a lot of cheese because it's so light, it's so fluffy. Now I'm gonna add more, but my point is that for this entire dish, which will serve you know, three or four people easy, you're gonna have about an ounce of cheese where you'll find phosphorus. And even though it's organic phosphorus, which means that it will not absorb as much, um, it is a dairy or meat phosphorus, which will absorb more than vegetable phosphorus. If that makes sense, anybody who follows along these things will understand. So here is about, not even, eight tenths of an ounce. So you can just see that, it, it, when you use this cheese and you grate it fresh and you use a microplane, you get a lot of little pieces which will distribute to the dish, which will affect the taste and the flavor wonderfully. If you use the pre-grated stuff, they add kind of a, you know, you've heard the tree stuff, you know, but they, they add more stuff to keep it stable so it doesn't stick. You can see our dish is getting along really nicely there. All right, so. This just has to cook a little longer. You can see as I move this, see how thick it is, how slow it comes back in there. You know, hopefully you can see that in the camera, but that's when you know you can add a little more. I'm just gonna add the rest of this, let it cook right through. Okay, now while that's finishing, why don't I just show you uh, the little final dish of our soup. I have a nice soup bowl here that we can use. How about this one today? Disappearing, but I will come back. Just to give you an idea what this looks like. 
I mean, we've been at the soup. The soup's been cooking for maybe about 25 minutes. You can see the greens are just starting to wilt. Um, it's pretty fresh. It's got a lot of fluid in there. As it cooks, it'll cook off longer. Now, I often like to do a little starch in there. So I made some homemade croutons. So again, if you buy croutons, they're gonna be loaded with sodium. You don't know what kind of bread they're gonna use. This may not be the best parts. I just make my, believe it or not, I even make my own bread and it went stale. I just roast them with some spices. So I get a lot of flavor out of them without adding all the sodium, which you can find in there. So I'm just gonna throw some of those in and it's gonna be good and hearty. You will find that uh, you'll get some starch in there, which will help be very filling. And that's your final dish. Number one. Oh, let's see if our timing works. It's not bad, not bad. We we're just about to get there. So at this point, if you were going to add, let's say a vegetable, broccoli, even a protein uh, provided it wouldn't overcook. If you added the shrimp now, it would certainly overcook. You wouldn't want that. Um, But you could add another veggie. You could add your asparagus now, even if it wasn't cooked. You put it in there for the last 10 minutes, it's gonna cook at that very high heat and it should work out pretty nicely. Um, broccoli, additional stuff, whatever you like. Timing here, we're trying to get it all done at the same time. We've got about a few minutes before that's ready. Again, this dish should be, it shouldn't be a lumpy dish. It shouldn't come out and be like your, like rice you have on a, as a side. Um, it's supposed to be creamy. Not quite soupy, but creamy and fluid a little bit. So not like a, a lump. The other thing I do with this, believe it or not, is um, the following day, it's not gonna be as creamy. You can add some liquid to it and it will, it'll come out nice, um, nicer. But I tend to make um, arancini with it. And arancini is just, a, a, when this rice is all stuck together in a lump, you, kind of put a little stuff in the middle, whether a piece of cheese or whether some meat that's cooked. And then you roll it in a standard fryer, a little egg, a little breadcrumbs, and you just fry it a little bit, even the pan. You could bake them as well if you put some oil on them. And then with a little tomato sauce. And that kind of can kind of give you that little taste of tomato sauce, even though we're not supposed to eat too much of it. Um, but again, so it's just taking a dish that I made one night, turning it into something that I can eat the other, just like I've done with the chicken stock. If I make my own, I've cooked all this chicken and I have that extra. I can turn it into chicken stock and the bones and the veggies. I can take the uh, chicken breast and use that as a, a nice chicken salad. Um, they use it on a salad, all kinds of different options. Um, again, so my point in all this is saying, if you're gonna go through the effort of making some of these items from scratch, there are a lot of different uses. So it's not gonna just go to waste. Your efforts, even if you're exhausted, can be used over and over. Uh, again, freezing the chicken stock, just to add it to, rice dishes, even when I cook rice, um, standard rice, a white rice or a, a brown rice, I add chicken stock to it instead of water. Adds another layer of flavor. I can eliminate some of the sodium. Look at how nice that's coming along. All right, so I think we're just about ready. Could use a little more time, but I don't wanna keep you all night if you're still here and you're still with me. And, uh, but well, we can just kind of show you what that's going to look like. Let's get a proper dish, or at least a dish. Famous screen bowls. So myself, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to line the bottom of this with a little Parmesan. Let's get my scale out of here. I don't think we need that. Let's see how we're doing. You can see it's getting nice and thick. Yeah. Now I would normally just take this right off the heat, which we are going to do. Again, you can cook that a little longer um, as long as the rice is cooked, but it's still gonna give you that nice soupish, but not too soupy feel to it. That's what I was looking for. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all my Parmesan and I'm gonna add it off the heat. And I'm going to stir that in, which will even give it a little more thickness, a lot of flavor. Oh, yeah, that looks good. And I can even top it off a little bit.
that nice cheese on the bottom will add some flavor all the way through. Now, there's our perfect little dish of risotto. If you wanted to add anything, add a little black pepper. And it's a lemon basil. So let's add a little garnish of lemon. You could even add some parsley if you like. But since we've gone with a basil dish, we're going to do that. If you want to get even a little crazier, we could. Add a little garnish here. You can see that. I don't know how that looks in my green. And once again, if you wanted to even go with some protein, we could add some fresh shrimp. Now, again, I would either make sure these were warm or I would stir them right through. But uh, for this purpose, we're just going to make it look pretty. And there you go. Some fresh risotto, lemon basil risotto with a little shrimp on top, a little garnish. And that's it. How do we do? We're at about 637. Looks like we've almost gone an hour. Um, so that is our cooking episode today. We made some, you can see how the absorbed right in there, uh, Tuscan bean soup with uh, fresh beans that we cooked. Some we did, some we didn't. And some wonderful risotto, some lemon basil risotto where we added a little bit of shrimp to it. You can find information like this on the website, uh, healthykidneys.org. You can check the Facebook page for, health, uh, for Northeast Kidney Foundation. You can find some of this information on my website, cookingforyourkidneys.com, and on my social media pages. Thanks for dropping by and joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you.